Welcome and thank, every, thank you for joining us today for our state reporting webinar featuring nationally recognized tax industry expert Steve Mercatant. Today, Steve will share some of the unique challenges with state reporting, and he is going to clarify the differences between the combined federal state filing program and direct state reporting. And I am Lauren Skinner Johnson with Convey Compliance, and I will be your moderator for today's event. Couple of quick housekeeping items before we get started. Um, first, to facilitate efficiency and respect everyone's time, everyone will be on mute for the duration of today's event. But if at any time you do have a question, please type it in the chat or the Q&A box, again, in the panel on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, we're actually gonna handle questions in a new way today. Um, throughout the presentation, Steve may speak to some of the questions that you're posting in the questions box. However, given the size of our audience, we're actually going to compile all of the questions that we received today, and um, we'll submit those to Steve, and he will help us create a frequently asked questions document that you'll receive along with today's webinar recording and the slides um, sometime next week. Again, that will be coming in an email from me next week. And now I am very pleased to introduce Steve Mercatant. As mentioned previously, Steve is a nationally recognized leader in tax reporting education and consulting on specialized compliance issues. He is the owner of TaxInformationReporting.com, which is a web-based consulting firm employing veteran tax attorneys who provide annual subscribers with accurate answers to their Form 1099 and 1042S related reporting questions. Steve received his Juris Doctor from the Michigan State University College of Law, graduating with a Certificate of International Law, and is an active member of the State Bar of Michigan. And with that, I would like to welcome Steve. Thank you, Lauren. Okay, as you can see today, we're going to be talking about um, state reporting only. Uh, Obviously, there's some aspects of the federal laws that come into play here as well, and where that does, we will mention that, especially in relation to the combined uh, federal state reporting program. Um, but the core of the focus is what's going on at the state level. Uh, and in short, there's a lot going on at the state level. Uh, so with that, let's get started and take a look at our agenda. Okay, um, so a couple of things we're going to be looking at here. Um, your approach, uh, what I mean by that uh, is uh, th how you analyze this issue. Uh, and that's very important um, because the laws are, are very different for each of the 50 states. And we're really looking at, by the way, um, information reporting here in a tax context. I'm also going to be mentioning some unclaimed property issues later on. But that's an entirely separate issue in terms of it's grounded in state property laws. So we're looking at tax law, we're looking at property law. Yes, there's a little bit um, of immigration law that comes into play, uh, so to speak, in the 1042S uh, context at the federal level. And I don't want you to get confused when you hear terms such as non-resident when it applies to the states. There are instances where the states are referring to actual non-resident aliens, but what we're really talking about for example, later on when I talk about California and we talk about residents versus part year residents versus non residents, are residents of the state, and we're assuming we're dealing with the U.S. person uh, rather than the non resident alien or non U.S. person. And in fact, uh, the IRS presumption is that you're, you should be presuming that whenever you come into a contact with a payee, you're dealing with a U.S. person. And so don't get confused about the uh, WA 1042S federal world when I use terminology such as that referring to residency in the states. Again, our focus today is on the states. And with that in the approach then, what we're looking at is whether or not uh, you and your uh, organization have nexus with a particular state. And I'll look at that more in a little bit. Uh, we're also going to look at the combined federal state um, reporting program as well. Uh, I'll explain more about Nexus. And then we'll have some examples of state and local reporting, uh, and really it's state reporting. Uh, you know, obviously we can't cover every state uh, or even more than a few 
in the short time we have today. Um, but what I can do is try to give you a flavor of the enormity of the task you're facing um, if you have reporting responsibilities in multiple states. Uh, and, and the goal here is to help you prepare uh, holistically for these states uh, in terms of uh, dealing with all their issues by trying to give you uh, a framework in which you can approach within an analysis and then uh, going within that uh, as you delve into each individual state laws. Uh, okay, now there are cities and municipalities, and just before we leave this slide, I did want to mention, because we're not really spending time on that today, um, and it's quite common to have states, and what I mean by cities and municipalities, that have these cities and municipalities that have separate reporting requirements from the federal government and from the state government. So for example, the state of Michigan has 20 cities that have unique reporting requirements in addition to the state of Michigan's reporting requirements, in addition to the federal reporting requirements. And you'll find that's not uncommon around the country. Major cities such as uh, Philadelphia, for example, have their own reporting requirements. In Michigan, it so happens most of the cities are relatively small, but that doesn't excuse the fact that there's an expectation of reporting in certain circumstances and that you, in fact, are staying on top of that otherwise potentially running afoul of then penalties and whatnot. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and move forward then. Okay, so when we're looking at the states, uh, what you need to know is, in, is the, the amount of change in the law. Everyone is focused on changes in federal law, and obviously there were the biggies with whether or not we were going to have to report payments made for, for goods, uh, or to corporations, um, but for the already existing requirement to report to uh, medical and legal service providers and non-U.S. corporations. Uh, and so the, the larger focus in the community has been on these big picture items. And what is flying under the radar is that over the last two years, there's been a tremendous amount of change in state reporting laws. So last year, my company documented over 30 major changes in state reporting laws. And when I use the term state reporting law, what I'm really talking about here again is um, when we refer to the tax context rather than specifically property laws. And when I say property law, what I'm really referring to is the unclaimed property context, uh, which we will talk about a little bit later. So 30 major changes in state, and by major what I'm talking about is not just little technical form changes. I'm talking about uh, changes in thresholds, uh, changes in uh, reporting requirements in terms of the transmission. Uh, for example, whether or not magnetic media is in play or it's been taken away, when and how electronic uh, reporting is required. Uh, for example, when we think of electronic reporting, we think of the federal level and we think of uh, 250 or more forms of any given 1099, oh, we have to report electronically. Well, not all states follow what the IRS does. A lot of them have their own unique regimes. Some states have an electronic reporting threshold as low as 25 forms, and, or a magnetic media threshold, believe it or not, because again, we think of the federal level and magnetic media has not been an acceptable form of reporting for a number of years now. And, and really, the feds are also looking to shut down paper reporting as much as possible um, just because of some of the inefficiencies associated with that. But at the state level, when we see the electronic, we'll see some states that have electronic reporting or magnetic media reporting thresholds. Those are two different things, by the way, um, of 25, of 50, uh, that track the federal level at 250. But you're not going to find any, any uh, uniform response there or uniform approach. And so you do need to be very, very careful with some of the most common some of the most common mistakes happen when people trip over thresholds, uh, dollar amount thresholds as well. When we think of the federal 1099 miscellaneous, we think of $600 uh, worth of services for the most common boxes. Obviously, uh, the royalties box, we're looking at a $10 threshold. Well, some of the states, it's, it's $1,500 or it's $1,000, which is great because that's a higher threshold. So it's a, it's a, a lesser reporting burden. Other states, it's lower. Other states, it's exactly equal to the federal level. So that's what we're talking about or what I'm talking about when I talk about 30 major changes. This year, I've already found over 30 uh, that I'm in the process of documenting for my clients. Uh, and so the question for you would be, 
in addition to all the all that you're trying to do to keep up with the changes in federal law, and I'm not trying to shortchange what's been going on with federal law. Don't get me wrong; these last few years have had some of the biggest changes in the information reporting community, or for that matter, in the tax code since probably the reforms of 1986. Uh, now, looking then, so not to shortchange that, but to look at the state level. Hopefully, you've been staying on top of these huge changes at that level because over the last two years, quite a bit is different than if maybe you waited a few years and haven't really looked at it lately. So what you're looking at here then is, um, is being up to date. And there's a variety of ways to do that. Uh, obviously, I'm giving you an overview from 10,000 feet here. We're not getting down into the weeds and the details of individual states. But that's what you're ultimately going to need to know. And so how are you doing that? Uh, are you doing it yourself? Is there someone on your team who's assigned to track the states and go through and try to determine where these changes have been made? Or have you contracted with an outside third party, for example, to help out with this? No matter how you're handling this, either in-house or you're getting outside help, hopefully you're handling it at some level and aren't just ignoring it. I suspect because you're here today that, in fact, you are uh, doing something about it. So it's great to have that and to have you here. Uh, okay, so let's go ahead and move on. Okay, now a couple of things to help you out here, uh, especially for those of you who are kind of doing things on their own and not seeking outside uh, help. Hopefully many of you have heard of the tax gap. Uh, and, and typically when you hear that phrase, you hear it is applied to the federal level in this $350 billion amount that goes back to a study done in 2001, but which since then has been fairly consistent within that range of uh, either a little bit more or a little bit less than $350 billion, which is obviously a huge sum of money. Uh, but that's the gap. What that means is, is the difference between what the federal government's taking in and what it should be taking in based upon what the law states in terms of uh, filing and reporting requirements of different types of payers. Now, the states are also struggling with massive budget issues and tax gaps of their own. That's where we're seeing a lot of these changes in state laws as well. If you were to survey and look at all these changes, you'll see what they're doing is, is they're trying to tighten up the reporting requirements, make it easier for you to report, which is a good thing from your perspective, but from their perspective, it's a good thing as well because then there's a higher level of compliance and ultimately that's what the goal is. The goal isn't just to level penalties. Um, the IRS itself is very much overwhelmed. So when it comes down to dealing with even something as minimal as processing a Form 972 CG proposed penalty notice, that takes a lot of time and effort on their part as well as yours. No less the effort associated with an audit. And so what the, the overall goal is is just to have compliance. If you have that compliance, and you have the independent contractors reporting at a level that approximately equates what's being done by those through payroll and the W-2 and whatnot, then everybody's happy from that perspective. Now, what you need to look at in terms of these individual states and their efforts to address this tax gap, again, is a variety of different laws. And we're covering several of those today in terms of the concept of the property law issues, the unclaimed property, and the concept of the tax law. And what's your core of what you're doing is, is you're looking at this term nexus. And nexus is a legal term of art. And what it's really talking about is this idea, this context of creating a link between a business, between your business activity and the location of it. Okay? And so I know most of you out there aren't lawyers listening in, but that doesn't mean you can't understand what this topic is and have an analytical framework to approach it. And the analysis is simple. Essentially, each and every time you suspect you may have a reporting requirement, uh, you're going to ask yourself uh, a question. Okay? So you're going you're to say, okay, I don't know, do we, essentially, do we have business in this state? Do I have business activities generating revenue in the particular state and or local municipality? If I do, then I likely may have a filing requirement. So what you will always want to do is try to keep it that simple. Do I have business activities generating revenue in a particular state? Now, of course, the devil's in the details. It always is. And so that gets into the definition of what's a business activity generating revenue. We'll talk about that in a second. 
Um, but before we move on and continue our discussion of Nexus, just note that you see here the list of the states that don't have specific Form 1099 information reporting requirements. But what you need to do is be careful because we're not just talking about uh, information reporting 1099 purposes. We're also talking about the reporting you have to do, for example, in terms of unclaimed property as a holder. Or one of the big new things that's been cropping up all across the nation is new hire reporting, independent contractor reporting that's outside of this 1099 process. So you need to be careful. Sales and use is another one. We don't have any time to talk about sales and use today. Whole other set of issues that you need to be aware of and ready to handle. Uh, okay, so let's, let's move on. Okay, so, so getting back to Nexus, this is important again. Uh, a lot of you are attempting to tackle these issues on your own, so I wanted to spend a little bit more time on this today. Uh, some of this I've mentioned here already. As you can tell by now, uh, I'm not a slide reader. Uh, the bullet point, I've actually packed a lot into these slides for you, so there's a lot of information here. Uh, and what I'm doing is I'm hitting the key points on each slide. Uh, and then kind of fleshing them out and filling them in beyond that. But what you want to do is kind of use the slides as an outline for approaching the issue in terms of not only creating a system of policies and procedures to deal with the issue, but also to give you an idea and give your staff or management an idea of what's going on here, what you're facing, because a lot of times there's pushback from other parts of your organization in relation to what it is you're driving at. And if you can give some concrete examples, which we provide later on, of some of the problems you're looking at, then it helps get some of these other aspects of your team on board, um, be it the management team or payroll or HR or the legal team where that comes into play. And for each of you, you may have a better relationship with one or more of those departments. So it is important that you take what you have and run with it but it's also important that you get others on board helping you meet these goals. Uh, and if for nothing else, just at a personal level, it's another way of establishing your value within the organization, showing what it is you're doing and the kinds of serious issues you're addressing because these issues generate a ton of liability for your organization, have the potential to. As a lawyer, of course, that's what I'm trained to look out for is liability for my clients. Um, but if you take the same mindset into play, you often find management also pays attention and keys into those liability issues. So determining nexus, as I mentioned earlier, this, this business connection. Do we have business, business activities generating revenue in a particular state? It's not simple. It's simple on its face when I say it like that. But there's different facts and circumstances that come into play to create this, uh, this nexus that you may have with one of the jurisdictions you may be dealing with. Again, not just at the state level, but also potentially at the local level. And so what I put here are some of the issues that, some examples of some of the things you should focus upon when you're trying to determine whether or not you have nexus. Uh, so for example, the methods used by your company to solicit sales. Uh, whether or not you have warranties or real property, real property versus tangible personal property versus intangible personal property. We'll look at this more a little bit, excuse me, later on in relation to California. Um, but the big one I want you to focus on, real property is pretty obvious. I think everybody knows what that is. Tangible personal property is another one that's fairly self-explanatory. But intangible personal property is one you really need to look at. Intellectual property, licenses, franchises is a big one. Uh, trademarks, copyright, uh, patent issues. Those are all forms of intellectual property. And so you want to be careful. Are those forms of intellectual property, for example, generating royalties from a given state? And obviously you can have that from other forms of uh, real property royalties, especially when it comes to mineral, oil, such rights. Um, but for the most, most of you, you're not in one of the extractive industries uh, in terms of raw materials, uh, you know, base raw economic materials. So what we're really looking at is this larger picture of how these things apply to the bulk of you or I'm trying to do today. And that's where I really do want you to focus on the intellectual property as much as possible. It's a hot area of the law. It's been booming over the last few years. It's become fleshed out, a lot of legal concepts. And as the law develops, then the regulators, the enforcers at the state level realize, hey, this is a hole in what we're doing. And it's a hole creating that tax gap again that they're trying to close. Now, what you might want to do at the bottom of the slide here 
is um, for your organization, different elements of the examples I list here are more important to you than others. You want to hone in on those. You might even want to create some sort of framework, uh, a rubric, if you will, for addressing each of these individual states and the different issues you might have in different states. So you might have an intellectual property issue in one state, but in another state you might have an issue of uh, real property or uh, an issue of employees or independent contractors uh, doing other sorts of business activities, for example, sales and whatnot in given states. Uh, so it can be different, not just in terms of the types of um, uh, questions you're looking at, but also that can change from state to state. So the overall idea with Nexus and how you approach it in creating this kind of simple little questionnaire for yourself is that you can take this framework and then have the same starting point at each state. Uh, consistency is important. It's very important. It's important not just for you in terms of efficiency, but it's important from the perspective of an auditor if they come in and look at what it is you're doing. Uh, to have a systematic approach is something that uh, can, and as I've said, it's not only efficient for your organization, but it's something that can also help get an auditor out of your hair a little bit more quickly um, than they otherwise may. And how you express that is important as well. Right in writing is the key. So having some written policies and procedures with some documents that can be taken and used in these different circumstances is of uh, the highest importance in terms of dealing with auditors and, and an audit. Uh, let's go ahead and move on. Okay, so, so your baseline is this idea of nexus. Do I have business activities generating revenue in a particular jurisdiction, in a particular state, in a particular city, uh, county in some of the states, it's by counties. I, I just throw that at you, I know you're ready to kill me at this point. Um, but yeah, counties. Um, and then you have, so, so that's your starting point. Now then you have one of the tools that are out there that can help simplify this process. Just be careful. There's some tricks here. There's some traps that can catch the unwary. And so when we look at the combined federal state filing program, uh, what we're really looking at is a system that's designed to allow payers, meaning you, third-party payers, uh, to code their electronic files uh, so that applicable returns sent to the IRS are then in turn forwarded to a state that's participating in the program. Now, it, this is obviously another reason why electronic filing is a great choice. Uh, no matter how many number of forms you have or what a threshold may be that requires it. Um, and in addition, of course, electronic filing also gives you extended deadlines and that further reduces the chance of IRS uh, proposed penalties, B notices, other negative interactions, not just with the IRS, but at the state level then if you have to generate uh, or deal with responses from state regulators involving your filing. So, uh, there, there's, there's a lot to it that can be helpful, especially in, cutting, in terms of cutting down corrections, if nothing else. Now, the, uh, you know, it's up to you to use the program here. Um, and if you do choose to use it, you have to let them know. There's a period where you can, and I think I talk about that. I'm not going to read through all this. A lot of this is self-explanatory. Um, but the test program, there it is. So it is on here. Um, you know, you have to submit to the test program for approval and I believe, if I remember correctly, that this year it was between uh, November 10th of this year and then the last chance you have to do so to submit for the test is a, uh, February 15th of next year, of 2012. Uh, and during that time period then you can get started on the process of signing up to use the program, so to speak. Uh, now, this doesn't apply to um, all the states. And then some of the things that you would do for the federal doesn't mean they automatically translate to the state. So you might be able to get a federal filing extension, uh, but that may not necessarily translate to the state. This is where you have to be careful um, because this isn't just, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's not a silver bullet that catches everything. Um, and, and that's one of the big dangers of the program. Uh, okay. So let's, let's go ahead and, and learn a little bit more about the, oh, okay, so here's the test file. So it was actually November 1st of this year uh, through February 15th. And then, uh, you know, that, that procedure's changed a little bit recently too. There used to be the form 6847 that was required. What's going to happen is you'll get an email back from the IRS. Uh, and two things here, make sure when you have the opportunity and you're filling out your information that you provide your email, 
Second, make sure you set, you know, however you do so, make sure your spam catcher allows emails from the IRS. Um, because that's how they're going to communicate with you and let you know whether the test is accepted or not, and then whether you've – essentially it's a, it's a dry run. So you understand whether or not when you actually go to file, this will work out for you. So it's very important. Now, you're not, you don't have to do it every year, um, but it, I recommend you do go through the test process each year uh, and make sure that you're set up uh, to, at a minimum, for the states that participate, um, meet these bare minimum requirements. Uh, and, and that's something you should be doing now, in all honesty, um, because in January you're going to be very busy with payee statements, and then after that you have to deal with the filing. And, and, and in actuality, for the states, just to say, there's different filing thresholds for different forms that, again, don't necessarily track with the federal level. So some of the states have dates such as February 15th, uh, and then you have your, your in the February 28th you're used to for the paper with the federal, but for some states that's their electronic deadline. Uh, so you want to be careful here um, because there's a lot of different ways to get trapped. Uh, and then unfortunately the 50 states each goes its own way um, and there's not a lot of commonality here. Uh, so you're going to get notified about the test filing and again the email is important. Um, and then if for some reason it's not acceptable, you have until February 15th, but again, you want to do this now before you get, you know, you're down in the weeds of everything else that you're going to have to do. Uh, okay, so let's go ahead and, and move on. Okay, some basic technical details here, uh, which I'm not going to read through, um, but some of the cautions I want you to focus on at the bottom here. Um, you know, again, make sure that the, the state accepts the same as the IRS uh, in terms of the, the participating in the program. And some states require, even though they participate in the program, and this is going to drive you nuts, they have their own outside filing requirements, not only if the state information differs from the federal information, but in other cases, if, for example, state withholding was required, then there may be a different filing uh, requirement for the state. And so you want to be careful about that. Uh, and then you have your corrections as well. Uh, and the states here can be different too. I, there's several states where they require, in terms of correction, they require electronic filing, you know, with very low thresholds. But then they may require corrections only be, to be done in paper. Or there are states that require at these low thresholds paper. And so you would think, well, then we do paper uh, in, in terms of the correction and not just the filing. And so it goes back and forth where it doesn't, uh, the, the bottom line lesson is you need to delve into each of the states and figure out how it is they approach the issue. Um, because whatever you think may not necessarily be the way it works. And you can't, you cannot, I cannot stress this enough, you can't just look at what the feds do and say, oh yeah, okay, then this is what I need to look forward, forward to with the, this particular state, with Massachusetts, for example, or Maryland, or one of the other states you see here. Um, okay. So, and, and by the way, the code here mentioned, just to go back toward the top of the slide, uh, the two-digit federal state code, you're going to find that in publication 1220. Highly, highly, highly recommend you review that publication now, again, before payee statement or filing season. Now is when you want to look at it. And, you know, you, there's different references out there that are there to help you. Well, Publication 1220 is literally, it's, it's the, the, the filing Bible. I mean, it's what you need to know about filing, about corrections, about the combined federal state filing program. This isn't lengthy reading either. It's a long document, but it has some very, each section is, is actually very tightly written, very, very well written in terms of being clear and easy to understand. It's not packed with legalese. Um, you know, and again, you may think, well, I'm biased because I'm used to reading this kind of stuff. Um, but, but again, uh, it's not like trying to interpret a statute. It's a lot easier to understand. And in general, I recommend that when you're confused about an issue, um, you start with the publications. Uh, they're, they're a great place to start with, learn about the issue, whether it's 1220 for this or 463 for reimbursing expenses or 515 for the non-U.S. person. You start there, and there's a zillion other publications, but those are just examples. But you start there. You learn more about what it is the law is requiring, and then ultimately you do have to know what the statute says, what the law says, 
Uh, you know, for example, you're doing backup withholding. It's what Section 3406 matters of the internal. That's what matters of the Internal Revenue Code. Even though there's a publication, I think it's 1281, that's got all kinds of FAQs and here's the steps you need to take. It's ultimately what that code section says. But that you're only citing in case you're in trouble, <laughs> you know, and the regulators come to you and said, hey, we're, we're looking at what you're doing. And in that case, it's all about, I, I like to call it show and tell. Uh, you show the regulator, you know what the law is, how it applies to your particular facts and circumstances, and hence why, um, you know, you should be essentially let go as, as easily as possible. Okay, but that's uh, neither here nor there. Let's uh, move on. Um, and in going beyond then the combined federal state filing program, a couple of things here as reminders of what we talked about earlier, covering a lot of ground in this hour, uh, and it, which is already halfway gone. Uh, and so I, I do, I set up some reminders in here for you and some things, you know, if you see it, if you see it in the slides more than once, that means it's really important, not that any of us, this is not important. Um, but you see here, the big thing is deciding on your compliance approach, and that's not something you should be pulling out of a hat. That's where you set up your analytical process, this idea of nexus. The funny thing is you'll actually even see the term nexus in some of the state reporting laws. So when they describe their laws, if you go to their different, for example, websites, or you, you get a hold of their publications and you look at it, you will see this term in there. And so the factors that, that, that matter, by the way, are those that are defined by each of the states. The definition I gave you earlier is a general overarching definition of this idea of bus generating business activity, creating revenue in a given state. But a lot of the states go and define that further. They break down the different forms of payments that meet nexus, for example, not just the different activities. Uh, so that's something at the state level you very much want to look at the definition. Just like with the IRS, it's the regulator's de definition that matters, not yours. So you may have a definition, a definitional idea in your head, um, but that's irrelevant next to what the particular law says. If the law says this is the definition of nexus that we're using to try to figure out if you come within a regulatory pur uh, purview, uh, then uh, that is uh, what it is. And so the, the, your goal here is, to, and, and your goal is not just for you either. I mean, obviously a lot of you probably have several members of your staff li listening in today. Um, but make sure that, uh, you know, when you're training your staff, the idea is to train them then on what these different laws mean in these different states and what's required at you, of you uh, at all the different levels. And then, of course, um, ideally, you, you would even have one member of your staff, in best case scenario, who's an expert on this topic, so to speak, for your organization. Or you have someone who is acting as that expert for you, educating you on these topics. Um, but, you know, just like uh, you're hopefully assigning a, a member of your staff to cover separate compliance issues, you have someone that's focused on the state issues. If you're really on your game, you're going to you're going to know you already know the states where you have nexus as of right now if you're really on your game you do then you're going within those states and breaking it down and saying okay are there municipalities now where we have nexus where we have a reporting requirement and what are those laws and that's the level you're trying to attain that's where you want to get to uh and and I'll I'll talk a little bit more about why that's so very important in a little bit uh, regarding the states and their approach to uh, enforcing uh, the laws regarding state reporting. Okay, um, so the rest here, uh, I've talked about a lot of this, uh, so and you can go ahead and read that on your own in your time. So let's let's move on to the next slide. Okay, so again, so we have some examples here, uh, and, and the idea here is that we have these different states and cities that I've chosen for a few examples. Uh, in the past, I've talked a lot. I've talked a lot about Michigan or Delaware, and uh, Pennsylvania is another one that, that's a great one for examples. Um, I have a few different ones today, just to expose you to some different things. If you've heard me before uh, talking about the different states, um, because they're so very different. And uh, but California is always a consistent, and I feel like it needs to be in there, not just because of the the massive size of California's economy, um, but it's a great example of a state that generally follows the IRS reporting requirements um, and thus is, is fairly strict, but in spite of that, 
still has its own unique reporting requirements. The point of these examples, though, um, is, is again, with California or some of the other states I look at, is to, to show you um, what some of these uh, differences are. And again, so you can take this information, not just for your own benefit, but if you're having trouble um, with, uh, for example, management, and they're like, yeah, this is an issue we have time to deal with this year, then you could show them, hey, look, you know, or, or they're like, this is just like federal filing, right? And you can say, no, it's not. Okay, there's some pretty big differences here. And even where there are states that participate in the combined federal state reporting program, um, there's still these, these other issues that come into play. And again, you're always trying to start off by keeping things simple, as simple as possible. I talked about Nexus earlier, but as you see on this slide, there's a couple of things that should jump, jump out at you. One, there's different definitions, examples provided of different California definitions for what a resident versus a part year resident is, and then different types of payment. And this goes back to something I just constantly get at with my clients and make sure they try to understand. When you're setting up your analytical process as simple as possible. The simplest pieces of information, ultimately, with every type of reporting jurisdiction, you're trying to figure out two things, okay? who your payee is and what the payment's for. That's it. And you need to figure out both of those things to have a reportable situation, and they need to meet the applicable thresholds required to have a reportable situation. So it always boils down to is who is my payee, what is the payment for? So today we're looking at all these different jurisdictions, but you're still using that same simple analysis to approach it. And you see that here with this idea of resident versus part year resident. That's going toward this issue of who is my payee? You're trying to figure out is my payee a resident of California? Because if they are, I need to handle this differently than if you're a part year resident. Or if the payee is a non resident and maybe getting back to California, uh, in, you know, for example, California has a mandatory withholding rule of 7% on payments made to non resident independent contractors in non-resident corporations. And now that, that it's got a pretty stiff threshold of $1,500 worth of payments in a year. So it doesn't get triggered as easily as the IRS requirement. Uh, it's more liberal than the IRS requirement of uh, $600, which, you know, it's a lower amount of money. Well, if it's a lower amount of money, that's, that's not good. That means that you're more likely to have to report. Um, so that's, that's one that's triggered, though, that's a rule of law that's triggered based on understanding who your payee is. And then you have your, your again, your, your different payment forms. And so earlier today I talked about this idea of uh, intangible property, of intellectual property. And so when you have these kind of forms of intangible income, uh, what you're looking at, well, here's some examples of that. And so some of the things you definitely need to stay on top of. Uh, okay, let's let's move on to the next slide. Um, okay, so more on the definition then of a non-resident. So uh, I forgot I had the non-resident here, but so earlier we had the um, part-time and the resident. So here we have the non-resident, and again the definitions mean a lot. And so uh, so what is the non-resident? Well, it's a, it's a definition by exclusion, as you can see here, um, in terms of the fact that it's essentially not what the others are. It's either not a resident or not a part-time resident. And then um, some examples of types of income then that could uh, lead you liable to California reporting, uh, again, just like the examples I provided earlier of uh, some of the things you look, need to look out for when you're trying to determine uh, nexus. Uh, otherwise, I think the slide is self-explanatory, so let's go ahead and move on. Okay, some of the California rules, um, you know, a couple of different things that jump out. Uh, you'll see that payee statements and then the electronic filing generally track with the IRS. You still want to be careful. You see these different forms here. Um, so you're looking for an extension. It's a different form than the federal form, okay, and that's what we have here. Um, and, and then you could file and get a further extension, but that's not likely. Uh, you know, it, I mean, it could happen. I'm not saying it won't, but much like the federal level, uh, you get the one, but maybe not the second uh, time period. Um, and in and, and California, just looking at the filing in general, um, even though they seemingly make it clear um, that its filing procedures are tracking with the IRS, there are these notable differences. Um, and again, from a technical aspect of the forms and what it is you need to do. 
uh, you know, for example, California, if you go and you look at um, the requirements, they'll tell you, well, they, you know, pretty much take a look at IRS Publication 1220. But then, after they see that, they'll go on and they'll let you know that there's also, by the way, and 1220 lists all the fields, to it, if you haven't had a chance to look at it, when it comes to filing, it provides examples of the filing fields you use, not just for the combined program or for dealing with corrections at the federal level, um, but with filing at the federal level. Well, then, in so California is saying, hey, look at the way they, that we do it for the feds, or w the way you do it for the feds, and we're pretty similar. Uh, but then California has a whole set of supplemental fields involving filing their forms. Uh, and those are different from the IRS, uh, not just on the um, A record for the payer, but the pay B record, um, and so on. So, you, again, uh, unfortunately, uh, even though they participate in the federal state filing program, you have to be careful uh, because they have a whole set of rules that go outside that program. Uh, okay, so let's go ahead and move on. Okay, uh, more on California then. Oh, and, and here it is. So just what I mentioned earlier, uh, the California Franchise Tax Board uh, ruling um, about mandatory withholding at the bottom of the slide uh, on the payments to the non-resident independent contractors, that 7% withholding on uh, the non-resident corporations, uh, and then the threshold. Uh, okay, and then um, the rest of this is, uh, yeah, I feel fairly self-explanatory and, and we're running out of time, so I'd rather focus on some stuff that's a little more uh, vague and ambiguous. Um, let's go ahead and move on. Uh, in speaking about vague and ambiguous, by the way, uh, regulatory law operates in a gray area. And a lot of times people get trapped, and, and I, I run across this a lot with my clients. They're looking for that one straight up, solid, silver bullet, I nailed it answer. And the problem with regulatory law is it's not written that way. It's written so that the, the policies, the procedures, the analytical framework you put in place matter. It's, it's almost like um, doing math, okay? It's, you have to show your work. It's not enough to, um, excuse me, come up with an answer. Uh, you know, you could say, well, here's my answer, and, and, and the regulator will say, well, that's not enough, and you're like, well, it's right. Well, it's not enough that it's right. You have to show me how you got here. You have to show me you know what the law is. You have to show that you're following the law. You have to show how it is you're updating yourself on the law. And all of that is things you do in writing, okay? So, so every little thing you do, unfortunately, on many levels, you want to document. Uh, you want to document who the responsible person is in your department, for example, uh, using the federal TIN match program. Who is that and when and how and what's their name and their title and everything else? Uh, who's the person that's being delegated the responsibility to use the program? And, and that's an example at the federal level. At the state levels, you know, and not just documenting these internal people who are in control of these things, who's responsible for updating you on the law? And then you say you know what the law is, well, prove it. And, and literally, it's that simple. You quote the law, and here's how it applies to our facts and circumstances. Um, so, because it's those facts and circumstances that matter, and that's that whole gray area I'm talking about. So. The law is written so that your interpretation of the law matters uh, and the facts of the situation matter. And you can look at the same law and have two different fact patterns and end up with two different answers in many cases. Not all, but in many. So be careful. Different state to look at here in New Jersey um, does things differently than in California. We see a different threshold for filing right off of the bat on a different issue, but you see what I was talking about earlier with these different dollar amounts, not just in relation to the federal level, but with the state, different states. Um, due dates, uh, it's interesting the due date uh, if you look at New Jersey law because it will say February 15th and then they say they will accept as late as February 28th. But you see the differences here uh, with California, also participates in the program, uh, again, the state provided as an example of a different state. Again, what do you do with these examples besides take them as a learning experience? If you're having trouble getting support for what it is you're trying to do back in the office, you can use this as ammunition to show the powers that be we have a situation here. And we can't just put together a uniform response. We have to stay on top of this. Okay, move on. So an example from Maryland. Uh, and here we require in Maryland, uh, we have magnetic media or electronic. Uh, State of Michigan is another one with the magnetic media. You'll find that's common, uh, even though at the federal level it's gone the way of the dinosaur. 
uh, participates in the combined federal state reporting because we, we do have electronic as well. Look at that threshold, uh, total number of required 1099 statements meet or exceed 25 for the tax year. So a very different threshold than the federal level. Um, and But here, yet again, something I was talking about earlier. So you have these electronic and magnetic media filing requirements for more than 25 of any given form 1099, but then it doesn't matter if you have to correct it, it has to be on paper. So even if you filed electronically or via magnetic media, your correction comes in on paper. One of the idiosyncrasies of Maryland law that's different than other states. Okay, let's move on. Okay, uh, just a review. <laughs> so I'm not going to go through this. We're running out of time. Let's move on. Uh, an example then, and actually I say city here, but it's uh, Ohio. They have a tax collection agency. I'll mention Ohio again in a second. Um, but uh, the regional or the central, central collection agency, um, which aggregates for different municipalities. So it's not just that there's a city requirement, there's an aggregating agency that collects for a variety of cities, and there's a requirement there in addition to the Ohio reporting requirements. I know, fun. Uh, okay, in a different threshold as well, um, uh, although it's, it actually tracks the federal when it comes to electronic, but again, you see the magnetic. Let's move on. Uh, city, uh, we have Philadelphia, uh, their own separate 10 and miscellaneous, and also Philadelphia now has its own form of a tax collection agency, but unlike Ohio, where municipalities are aggregated into one tax collection agency or another, in Pennsylvania, or in Pennsylvania, we have the county-based system I had alluded to earlier today. And then in Philadelphia, they have their own requirement. Okay, let's move on. Okay, now, I had mentioned this earlier, and today is not about unclaimed property. I just want to expose you to it um, because it's a state reporting issue. It is an issue of property law. It's not an issue of tax law. It's an issue that's important because Although more and more of my clients that I talk to or people that I meet are getting on top of the unclaimed property issue, there's still a lot out there that aren't. Uh, and it's important because states, remember that tax gap I talked about? Well, states with their own budget issues are looking at unclaimed property as a cash cow to help deal with those issues. And so they're ramping up things uh, tighter than ever and they're, what they're doing is they're, they're lowering these thresholds, they're lowering the amount of years that is required to, um, it, not only as a holder, but that, that trigger the unclaimed property laws. And so because of this huge flux in the laws, because the states are using unclaimed property as a vehicle to generate revenue, you better be on top of it. So let's move on. The definition, very simple. This is a generic definition generic examples, each state will have their own. However, it will generally track something like you see here, basically unclaimed property. You also hear the term escheatment, escheated property. That's a legal term. You know, it's one of those crazy words that go back to old English and hundreds of years ago that still is kicking around in the legal system. So don't just think unclaimed property. If you see this term escheatment, it starts with an E. It's like E-S-C-H-E-A-T-M-E-N-T. So it's even spelled weird. You see that weird word, then you know that we're talking about unclaimed property. Don't just ignore it. But here's your definition. Here's some examples. You see here in the examples, too, it's a lot of um, in terms of uh, money issues is obviously the big one. Uh, uncashed checks is an, it's one that traps a lot of people. I mean, just because the check's not cash doesn't mean it's your property. It's still property that belongs to someone else. They just haven't claimed it. Uh, so be careful with that. Okay, moving on. Okay, when is it abandoned? When is it, when is it not abandoned? So these are some things you want to look for when trying to determine whether the true owner of the property, uh, for example, the uncashed check has abandoned it or not. And this is important in terms of triggering your responsibilities as a holder. Moving on. So we have to report all holders. Well, what's a holder? This here, we talk about what a holder is and what a holder must do. Again, um, it, there's a term here, due diligence. It's very important. It's important in general, 
But the expectation is that as a third-party information reporter, you're acting as a reasonably prudent third-party information reporter, which means you're doing things like your due diligence. You're, you're checking up on things. You have your tracking systems in place. You're staying on top of things. That's your due diligence under the law. It's not enough to say, oh, okay, we looked at this, didn't see anything. No, you have to be able to track it. You have to have a system in place. Okay, moving forward. Okay, uh, worker classification. Now, the feds recently had a bit of an amnesty program this fall. Uh, the states have been all over this like you wouldn't believe. And when I, when I say this, what I'm talking about here is the, this, and sometimes it's intentional, sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's intentional maneuvering to cut costs um, by wrongly classifying regular employees as independent contractors. Um, other times it's, it's an incidental. Uh, you know, Bob used to work here, he retired. Now he's back as a contractor, but Bob's back in his old desk. He's got his old phone line, and he's getting assignments just like the regular employees do. He's participating in training just like the regular employees. That's a big one. Uh, you're, you bring in an outside contractor. The expectation is you don't have to train them. They know what it is they're doing. Um, regardless, though, uh, you know you have this situation then of the state, for, and, and it's what we're talking about here, not the IRS, um, but this applies to the IRS as well. The state is saying, hey, you're calling this person a uh, independent contractor, but when we look at how they're being employed, what we see here is an employee. We see this worker, the overall term being a worker that encompasses both um, independent contractors and employees, this worker as an independent contractor. And so what you're doing is by classifying them as an independent contractor when we believe them to be an employee, uh, you're not paying things that are costing our state. And so you're not paying things like unemployment insurance taxes. And you're not paying workers' compensation premiums. Uh, there's lost income tax revenue, things like this. Uh, for example, getting back to Ohio, and just recently Ohio identified 92,500 misclassified workers. 92,500. That is a lot of people they're saying are misclassified by their employer meaning your employer potentially, meaning you're potentially on the hook for these penalties and these fines. And so the states are on it, state attorney generals are all over it, and again, why it goes back to that tax gap issue. The states are broke. They are laying off people left and right. Uh, they don't have uh, the, the resources they need to do what it is they need to do, depending on what that is in each state. So they're looking for those resources, AKA revenue, and they're trying to do it within a larger societal framework that frowns upon taxes. So if we're not going to raise taxes to generate revenue, what are we going to do? We're going to squeeze some more blood out of that rock. We're going to enforce the existing laws. And one of those laws that's easy to enforce and easy to generate revenue is when it comes to these issues. I'm not going to get into all the details of how to define whether or not a worker is an employee or an independent contractor. If you need help with that, I'd be more than happy to help. Or uh, hopefully you have policies in place that relate to this at the federal level. But again, make sure you look at how the individual states handle it. Um, I can give you more examples. Illinois just nailed a home improvement company. Uh, in California, the former attorney general, now the, the, the governor, uh, went after a construction firm. Uh, the construction firms are big, by the way. Um, that's a heavy, heavy focus of the IRS, not just the states, um, and so on and so forth. I can give you a zillion examples of this, but the bottom line is cracking down on these laws is a politically PC way of generating revenue that doesn't get a lot of pushback from the general public. So you need to be aware of it. You need to be on top of it. And even worse, if we move ahead to the next slide, um, okay, some of the definitions. Let's. We're running out of time, so let's skip that. Um, let's go to the next slide after this. Uh, some of the consequences, I mentioned some of these earlier, so let's move on. The, the point I wanted to finish was not just how the, the issue arises. The workers are less likely for this to come from the worker right now because the um, employment situation is so horrific, and, 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 and most employees are, are very much want to not rock the boat. Um, they used to be a common way of it happening. It's something your, your attorney needs to be aware of. Um, but really the issue we're looking at is the coordination, if we move to the next slide, um, between the state and the federal government. They're actually sharing information. They've gotten efficient. 
Um, they're coordinating their, their, their plan of attack, so to speak, where they never did before. One of the things that used to happen before is you could flip through the regulatory framework because it was so poor. But now there's information sharing that I'm going actually for four years now, been an active federal state um, information sharing program when it comes to issues of worker class. Uh, so be careful. Okay? Uh, and that's, I can go on and on, but I can't for a time. On? Uh, I have some FAQs, frequently asked questions I included in here for you, for your benefit. Um, you get a lot of questions about Nexus, so this one about Nexus. Don't have time to go over it in detail. Uh, the combined federal filing program, another type of question I often get from my clients. Uh, again, for your benefit, let's move on. Uh, again, uh, there's always, again, there's always questions about Nexus, so it's a big one. It's a tough, it can be a tough concept to wrap your head around, but let's move on. And another Nexus question, let's move on. Again, you can read these in your own time. So moving on. Okay, um, by the way, I offer help, so this is a little bit about what I do, but I actually put out a form and threshold and state reporting update. Uh, it looked at all the states and the reporting requirements, and there's been a lot of change. And so the changes are encapsulated, but I hope it's chart part of our guide uh, on Friday. Uh, so if you're interested in that, you can take that there. And I turn it over to Bob. I think we've got one more slide with the disclaimer. And we'll go ahead and straight on back to today. Great. Thank you, Steve. We really appreciate your expert view on these issues and on state reporting. Um, now, with the last few minutes, I'd like to introduce Ray Grove, who's a product manager for Convey. Ray, can you just take us through a quick explanation on how Convey can help? Yeah, absolutely. You know, first, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. Um, and second, uh, as many of you are probably aware, Convey is a uh, software as a service provider for 1099 and compliance reporting solutions. So for many of you that uh, are handling this process or struggling with it, the one thing I would like to say to all of you is it's not too late uh, to take a look at your process and change what you're doing even this year. Um, we offer a variety of solutions that can automate uh, much of this process for you. So uh, you can reach out to us either by uh, coming to our website at convey.com um, and there's uh, additional information on who to call and contact there. Great. Thanks, Ray. And one other thing I'd like to note is that every year Convey puts on um, an annual tax and regulatory conference, and Steve has also spoke at the past couple of conferences. Um, it, this conference is called the C2 Summit, and this year it will be at the Omni Dallas Hotel in Dallas, Texas. And it's starting on Sunday, September 23rd and going through Wednesday, September 25th. And this is a live tax information reporting seminar that typically includes about two and a half days of regulatory as well as some compliance and some convey solution sessions. So that concludes our webinar today. And before I let you go, again, we have recorded today's webinar, and I will be sending out an email with a link to the recorded version of the webinar, as well as the slides later this week, probably on Friday. And then next week, you'll get another email from me that will include a list of today's questions and Steve's responses to those questions. Um, on the screen, you'll see also a couple of other ways to stay up to date on text regulatory and compliance issues, you can visit our 1099 News blog, or you can always find us on Twitter or LinkedIn. And as always, if you have any other questions, you can call us at 1-888-303-1099, or you can visit us at convey.com. And with that, we are concluding today's event. Thank you for joining us.